Hello, everyone, and welcome to Performance Anxiety's 20th online reading event. My name is Tom Snarsky, and I'm so excited to have the opportunity to host this stellar group of readers tonight. A quick bit of background before we begin. In case you haven't listened in before, Performance Anxiety is an online reading series hosted via Skype, usually on the third Thursday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. At each of our events, we normally feature up to 10 readers who each have around five minutes to share a selection of their writing with us. Tonight, we have five fabulous readers here to share their poems with you, so the numbers are flipped, and we're pumped to hear 10 minutes plus of poetry from each of them. Having all these slots every month means we're always looking for folks who would be interested in reading with us. So if you are or know a poet or writer who'd be interested in sharing their work at a future event, you're more than welcome to get in touch with us via the Performance Anxiety Twitter account. That's at Performance A-N-X-T on Twitter. Or you can DM the co-organizers directly. I'm at Tom Snarsky, T-O-M-S-N-A-R-S-K-Y on Twitter and Instagram. Or you can just email me at TomSnarsky at gmail.com. You can also get in touch with Kristen Garth, our other co-organizer, who we are very happy to have back on with us live after her harrowing run-in with Hurricane Sally last month and lots else besides. So without any further ado, I'm going to formally introduce our co-organizer and first reader, Kristen Garth. Kristen Garth is a pushcart, best of the net, and Ristling nominated sonnet stalker. Her sonnets have stalked journals like Glass, Yes, 521, Luna Luna, and more. She is the author of 17 books of poetry, including Pink Plastic House from Maverick Duck Press, Crow Carriage from the Hedgehog Poetry Press, Flutter Southern Gothic Fever Dream from Twisted Press, The Meadow from Apep Publications, one of my favorites, and Golden Ticket available now from Roaring Junior Press. Founder of Pink Plastic House, a tiny journal, and co-founder of Performance Anxiety, this very online poetry reading series. So Asparagus welcomes you, Kristen. We're so <laughs> glad to have you back. Take it away. <laughs> Yay, asparagus. Okay, uh, the first poem, I'm going to start with the most depressing because I uh, just explain why I wasn't here last time that I had a good reason. And uh, this poem was published in um, Punk Noir recently, and it's called The Drowning Season. And these are all Shakespearean sonnets. After the flood, the stuffed animals smell. Peter Rabbit fell from bed as you fled. 8 a.m. when the bay waves, fishes, shell, well into lawn, bedroom, past your bedspread, into the den when you run out the door, in water deeper than ever before, winds because the hurricane has come ashore and will remain the afternoon, lives in mementos that seep through your hands, a painting gifted by a dead man whose disintegration is more than you can stand. Pink plastic house and Barbie suffused with torrents who leave you layered in mud. You drown for a season after the flood. And I'm, things are getting better. <laughs> but that was a poem I wrote in the midst of depression of trying to put my life back together. And um, anyway. And also, while well, right before the hurricane hit, I was working on this um, poem a day group, and I started this little um, story called um, uh, Girlarium, which is kind of funny because it's all about a girl, you know, submerged in water, and that became my life. But um, so it's it's been a little weird <laughs> working on it after. But this is a poem I wrote from that that I was going to read called "The Creature." Science defines her by what she would hide. Two swaths of skin, her neck either side. Small fraction of flesh, just a few inches wide. Requires new nomenclature, protocol. It has yet to provide. For now, amidst others, when you think it won't hear, you refer to the creature, fill hearts with fear. Your druthers, they never investigate. Workers you pay to renovate the aquariums, connect and expand, giving this creature as much as you can of your land. Yes, still some restrictions for security. Creatures have hidden dangers in water they might swirl, resembling even a trapped teenage girl. And um, the rest of the poems I'm going to read are more, um, well, the next three are going to be more like horror, more Halloween, and I've been trying to get back into my um, Halloween-loving spirit, so, um, you know, anyway, here's the first one that's going to come out, I think, tomorrow, or pretty soon, in Wine Cellar Press, and the next issue, it's called Blur. Matriculated many months ago, from phonetic faux fellatio, 
pupil you never wanted me to be follows a blur beneath black locust trees. Fertile a couple weeks a year before reason reappears. Careless with pigtailed pioneers. Fuck dolls with dank eyes shown shut by demons you cannot confront. They all disappear with sustenance of blooms when the season requisitions tombs decorated in pastels. Halo for the harlot heathen you once knew well. From grave I hide within to masticate upon my own hunger. I masturbate until it's all a blur. And then the next poem I'm going to read is called Mithridatism. They press a thimbleful to your lips during the rarest celestial eclipse. They say you must swallow Venus obscures, whirring of shadows, sentience blurs. That first day you seize upon symbols inscribed on the floor amidst a circle of elders who have done so before. Conjures, cyclops, centaurs, seraphim, fiends upon your behalf as you float between home, heaven, hell, psychopharmacological paths. Wound you will weather to one day be well. Writhing for witnesses weakened with wrath, but immune to the poison enemies pour. Tonight they give you a little more. And this is a poem that I wrote for um, the Daily Drunk, and I love their um, prompts that they do. Um, they, you know, give out prompts all the time, and I try to always do them whenever I have free time because it's just, a, I love prompts. And it was a Keanu Reeves' birthday, and so um, a lot of people were writing about some of his lighter movies, but I wrote about um, Neon Demon, where he plays a really, really dark character. And so this is called Broke Down Motel of Falsified IDs. He is a keeper. Lolitas and Keys, broke down motel of falsified IDs, Ch children, professionals teach to, to seduce, small town pageant princesses fleeing abuse, spend their days in body paint, maybe meant for a porn, then dinners with directors where a 20 something scorned before they lay down pretty heads into his care. He does not need a key to penetrate their nightmares. Pairs them together with thin common walls. Neighbors' fate reverberates through them all. Runaways make it into the city, long legs their skeleton keys. For some, the last keeper, doe eyes do see. And the next poem I wrote is about, a, it's a frastic poem called Little Witches, and it's based on a Justin O'Neill um, picture that I have in my house um, that's two little witches outside the church that's burning, and I decided to write a poem about why they're happy that this church is burning, and so this is my story. We will race her sisters there, past gargoyles down a swiveled silver stair, one who rides its rail, body of snake, chiseled coil to marble tongue, will take the lead, then chide the rest, a mob with matches in pockets of each prairie dress. Onyx bonnets, flush of cheeks, midnight mission, her hair in lockets, memorializing meek, beats, breasts that rush towards revenge. Inside the place she met her end, the chapel of malevolence, where orphans kneel in cast off smocked rosettes, perversions ritualized as reverence. What some name this place is not our concern. It is only evil, little witches burn. And the last poem I'm going to read, I just wrote today, it hasn't been published yet, but it's called Plasticity, and it's a Barbie, dark Barbie poem, so... Here we go. Um, pliable arms, you pose us for prayer. High collared dress, veil pins hair. Lifelike bend, synthetic submissive knees. Back blares a voice box of holes, yes sir, and please. 
Night widens our thighs, shortens our memories of the paradoxical uses of our plasticity. Poised before ASB plastic pelvis, pretense of cock, true love with kin dolls have rituals of which we must never talk. Um, anoint our flexible joints with pearls, purchased accessory seed, because sex, religion, or extortable needs to heed or ignore judiciously, we were procured for our plasticity. Thank you, you guys. Thank you so much, Kristen. That was wonderful. We were blown up in the chat with uh, the hashtag new shit because we love it when we see new work from poets <laughs> not out there anywhere else. And again, that was Kristen Garth back in rare form, also touting Neon Demon, which I think is a deeply underrated movie. So I appreciate that that made an appearance too. Um, and if you want to get in touch with Kristen, also about performance anxiety or about any of the great projects that she's got going on, you can follow her on Twitter at Lola and Jolie, L O L A. A-N-D-J-O-L-I-E. And you can find all of her stuff, her books, other projects, etc., on her website, which is Kristen Garth, K-R-I-S-T-I-N-G-A-R-T-H dot com. So thank you so much, Kristen. I'm just going to pop in here really quick. Awesome. Um, so without any further ado, I am super excited to introduce our next reader, who is a first-timer to Performance Anxiety, and that's Sarah Kersey. Sarah Kersey is a poet and x-ray technologist from New Jersey. Her work has appeared in the Hellbor, Feral Poetry Journal, Columbia Journal Online, and elsewhere. Sarah is an associate editor for South Florida Poetry Journal. Thank you so much for being with us, Sarah. I'm really excited to hear what you're going to share with us tonight. Thanks for having me, Tom and Kristen. Um, in the spirit of new work, I'm going to read some brand new out-of-the-box poems, some recent poems, some old poems, and one that's not mine, not necessarily in that order, but I will start with Brand new out of the box poems. All right, so to start, thank you, Tom, for your enthusiasm. I love it. Uh, I'm going to start with um, the first one after listening to I've Known Rivers by Gary Bartz. I was once stunning, cosmic, and 16. I rendered outer space night, said it was alive. My white guitar teacher gasped. I could do the Hendrix hand wrap around the guitar neck. Now my hand can't hear what's in my head. My hand is a tent and fingers its pins which uproot and scatter along the fretboard. My head doesn't know home anymore. I don't know how to get there. I can't find resolution at the end of a song. I wander, follow the ambling of an arpeggiation. Okay, the second one is also brand new. It's called Alone, Awake, and Aware of My Blood. I'm not drinking tonight. I'm letting nomadic notes build up bacteria. I'm tasting morning all day long. Sleep is staying in my eyes until it is time to rest again. I'm keeping the heat on because there is no one to warm me. I'm keeping the lights on, running up the electric bill, staying up for somebody anybody to touch me. For now, either hand will do. I'm undoing my own shirt, my own button down shirt. I'm a conservative dresser with ambivalent blood, changing hue from red to blue, that long circulating longing to my fingers and toes, ancient vessels, arteries don't crack, veins don't puncture. I wish something would puncture me tonight. My own blood rushing to the site, preserving me. <clears throat> okay. Uh, next, brand new out of the box. The Negro Speaks bo speaks of Bodies, which is after The Negro Speaks of Rivers by Langston Hughes. I've known bodies. I've known bodies before the bodies syllables were fashionable on every poet's lips. My soul had a body. My soul was a body. It was more than you could ever write. I bathed in hibiscus at sunset. A fever flowed through me. My heart masticated on its own pulp, yes, on those fruity chambers. And when the Nile turned to blood, I knew it was alive. It needed only a fabric of flesh to cover it. 
Its stench knotted itself in ethmoid air cells, which you have that butterfly-shaped bone in your face, too. Every inspiration gives you lift. Every exhale anchors you to this ground, and you stay. I've known bodies, self-sustaining bodies. My soul had a body. Okay, I'm going to pray that my tablet doesn't crap out. Uh, okay. All right. Next, um, I'm going to read, let's see. I'm going to read an old poem now. This, this is about four years old. Um, it's called Impeto. It's Italian for in private. On our wavelength of light, crestfallen, dim, and lackluster, my king humbles himself in her queen-size bed, yielding to slumber. The warmth of the flicker off his skin tests my thighs for a response he doesn't know he called for. An arterial mist like perfume. My breathing is buoyant, matchless. My heart steps to the side to make room, my love. Walcott's white egrets offers a celestial exit tucked behind snow-stuffed skies of March up to the crescent moon trumpeting for an old friend. My rib cage is driftwood to straddle, secure from the irresistible surge of blood, from many waves of blue liquid love effused from self-abuse. My love is safe with me. My love, invisible, heady love, halting love, supplements my book before bed. Okay, um, and as I mentioned that poem, I'm a huge Derek Walcott fan. So I'm now gonna read one of his, and just how much of a fan you ask? Like that much of a fan, and I have other stuff on my shelf as well. Um, I'm gonna read one of my favorite passages um, that he wrote from Another Life, which is his autobiography in verse. And I read this poem at least once every two weeks because it makes me think of my mom, so this one's kind of for her. Um, I'm going to read a selection from chapter two, section three, and it starts like this. Old house, old woman, old room, old planes, old buckling membranes of the womb, translucent walls, breathe through your timbers, gasp arthritic, curling beams, cough in old air, shining with motes. Stare, polished and repolished by the hands of strangers. Die with defiance flecking your gray eyes, motes of a sunlit air. Your timbers humming with constellations of carcinoma, your bed frames glowing with radium, cold iron dilating the fever of your body, while the galvanized iron snaps in spasms of pain. The house gives no outcry. It bears the depth of forest, of ocean and mother each consuming the other with memory and unuse. Why should we weep for dumb things? This radiance of sharing extends to the simplest objects, to a favorite hammer, a paintbrush, a toothless gum sunken old shoe, to the brain of a child room, retarded, lobotomized of its furniture, stuttering its inventories of accidents. Why this chair cracked? When did that tightened when the, did the tightened scream of that bed spring finally snap? When did that unsilvering mirror finally surrender her vanity? And in turn, these objects assess us. That yellow paper flower with the, eye, the eyes of a cat, that stain familiar as warts or some birthmark, as the badge of some loved defect. Defect. While the thorns of the bougainvillea molt like old fingernails, and the flower keep falling and the flowers keep opening the alamandas fall in bugles but nobody charges skin wrinkles like paint the forearm of a balustrade freckles crows feet radiate from the shut eyes of windows and the door mouth clamped reveals nothing for there is no secret there is no other secret but a pain so alive that to touch every ledge of that house edges a scream from the burning wires the nerves with their constellation of cancer, the beams with their star seed of lice, pain shrinking every room, pain shining in every womb, while the blind, dumb termites with jaws of the crab cells consume, and silent thunder to the last of all Sundays consume. Finger each object, 
lift it from its place, and it screams again to be put down in its ring of dust, like the marriage finger frantic without its ring. I can no more move you from your true alignment, mother, than we can move objects and paintings. Your house sang softly a balance of the rightness of placed things. Yeah, like I said, I read that at least like once every two weeks. <laughs> I'm just glad I didn't like ball crying. Okay, uh, thanks guys. Two minute warning, cool. All right, so let's do another old poem. This one's called Boxing Ring. Pendente Lite. Fistful of regrets ever poised for a jolting uppercut, a heart too raw to consume. I am resigning from the ring, rescinding my vows of fidelity, snugly held by my finger, groomed for whole life to drag the way a smoker expands his periphery. Disintegrate by half-life into its most potent parts and the rest will flee from the heart between my hips. Divorce decree. Loosen stiff muscles too tight for commitment. Experience exfoliated my face, stripped reptilian subduction off my cheekbones. Sheared seven hair off my head, and your scepter is severed. Now, finally, a breathless eternity panting, arresting in its afterlife, bond broken. I am exhausted. I exhale. I cry for a time before I tricked myself into a vow unuttered, engaged the way some play with their tongues, linguistic, linguistic as gymnasts. I reach for stability not found in the perimeter of the ring where defeat is elastic. All right. Uh, okay, I'm gonna read this one. Also older, I love it. So I work, as Tom introduced, I work in healthcare. So I'm really interested in medical terminology. Um, and I love this word Mittelschmerz which is German uh, denoting middle pain. And it's the word described for folks who ovulate, um, the, uh, like the ovarian pain that you feel when ovulating. Um, so this, this poem is basically an ode to ovulation. Okay. Something in her womb leaps in expectation of a suitor, a dismembered limb being fitted for a prosthesis, smoldering for synergy. Patient pucker, blowing bubble gum, not exactly pretty, but playful. Her lips drip preparing for his kiss. Hips, bold and burden and risk. Geometric proof, triangulating eyes for a could be lover. Beckoning an earnest in hazy heat to lie like Nile reeds con concealing their infant precious and forbidden. To lie like sweat coordinating pleasure points on intersecting axes framed as infinity sharing one sheet crisply creased into kissing coronals. His hypotenuse opposite her right angle, unredacting her most private parts, misspelling her words in intimate whispers. Her temperature will not abate until his seed swims upstream, but the nape of her neck remains unkissed this period. The guest did not arrive this time. She is vengeful when love doesn't take. Peyton pucker spinning in contempt, stripping garments off a fleeing man, shedding linens, laying bare the fault, but no one is to blame. Some things just happen this way, impotently and intolerably. All right. I'm going to read one more. Thanks, guys. I'm going to read one more. Um, this came out in the Hellboard back in July. Um, and I just want to give like quick content warning slash trigger warning. This it has depictions of sexual assault and abuse. Okay. So if you need to like mute or excuse yourself, do what you got to do. When Atlantis went under, it broke us. Actually, I should probably give full context here. It might make it a little easier. So I wrote this poem late last year, probably like actually a year in November. And um, we see a lot in healthcare, and this is actually based off of, of a, a true experience, which I kind of like move some stuff around. Um, so I'll just say that because I just remember that this is going to be on YouTube, so I should be careful with what I, what I say. But when Atlantis went under, it broke us. You are buried in sand at the beach. The waves don't wash away your burden, but bring your mother's sea glass eyes, which shone away from you. 
Hands like driftwood slap your face, even now. Syringes come too, they don't tranquilize. You don't want another life with debris. Meanwhile, a metal detector buses shorelines for money. It approaches you, hovers like a UFO, hums for the thing inside you to come home, exposes you, puts rays inside you. It summons a spirit. You lie on the life inside you. You deny your belly's big brags. Little girl, don't lie like that. Don't make me party to your pain like that. Before light shone through, I judged your body bare. Curtains covered you, and oh, so much to bear for the both of us. A window facing east, a day you aren't ready for. You were hoping my x-ray machine would kill the baby. I understand, but it wouldn't have worked. You're too far along, yet you hide so well. My boss questions my coworkers about the radiographs, asks what they see. They look right through the fetus, miss its spine, which corkscrews towards the day that will split her apart. My boss tells me that tech's more seasoned than I am missed it, that I shouldn't feel bad, that this happens to the best of techs, that I won't be written up, that, that what covered me is good documentation, I had written a date of last menstrual period, denied being pregnant, shielded, that we can't help it if people lie. But I hear the lie tell on itself. I will be born. I, I will raise myself up. I will give myself to my mother. I will cry for her as she cries for herself. My auntie got pregnant at 14. Shame the whole family, my mother said. I understood. Body parted like city gates. My father, a battering ram, pounded against my abdomen, panted, you're not going to grow up to be anything. I understood. Did he feel like a machine gun coming? Did I sh shift the shrapnel inside you? I'm sorry. Did I roll that bomb? Is it booming? I'm sorry. I never wanted a loud life either. I keep my hands to my ears, hear my blood flow, a drowning ocean. Atlas is in it. His own father wouldn't save his kingdom. What chance do we have? We have no protection. All we can pray for is for the rain to attenuate our shame. That's all I got. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Wow, Sarah, thank you so much. That was awesome. And please, you know, time time knows nothing about poetry. So that was that was beautiful. And I it had like I have this book box of like books that got banished from the shelves because they were too big and that giant Walcott book is in there. And now I like gotta go dig it out. It's right staring at me from the top up there. Oh, you and you had math. Too? Yeah, I have. It's like it's buried oh, awesome. at the very top of this box because I it doesn't fit on the shelves. It's with the Miro Rukeyser that's too tall to fit on the shelves and all that. So you have inspired the need to bring it back into the world of Thank of you. stuff. Thank you so much for those beautiful poems. And that again was Sarah Kersey, who you can find on Twitter at sk underscore underscore poet. Um, and Sarah again is also the associate editor for South Florida Poetry Journal, who you can find on Twitter at Soflo Pojo, S O F L O P O J O. Um, so please give them a look and please read more of Sarah's amazing work. Um, wow, man, I'm like still sort of coming down off of that. Um, so yeah, so it's amazing to me, uh, you know, with a shorter lineup, we're already at the middle of our order, but it's, it's, I'm super excited to introduce our next poet, and that's Zora Satchel. Zora Satchel is a 24-year-old Black queer poet who writes about mental illness, family, and friendship. She believes that poetry creates space to explore and heal from trauma, as well as allow us to imagine new worlds. She is a member of the Estuary Collective and holds a degree in ethnic studies from Colorado State University. She also serves as a reader for Borderlands, Texas Poetry Review, and OK Donkey Press. When she's not writing, she's obsessively consuming pop culture. She loves good dance music and watching movies. You can find her on Twitter, at The Casual Revolt, where she lets her typos run wild. Thank you, Zora, so much for being here with us tonight. Um, and I'm so excited to hear what you're going to read tonight. And also, I think I might have muted you aggressively, because I'm like the worst host ever. So let me know if you need to be unmuted. <laughs> There we go. I unmuted myself. We're good. 
thank but you. thank you for saying something because I was chatting thinking everybody could hear me. Um, so I'm happy to be here tonight and I hope y'all like uh, what I have brought to the table. Um, trigger warning, a couple of the poems I, I'm going to read handle suicide attempts and suicide ideation. So if that is something that's very difficult for you, I totally understand it's something that's difficult for me. So if you need to excuse yourself, do what you got to do. So the first poem is called Stones in Your Pocket, Screaming Underwater. My girlfriend told me she had to give her neighbors knives back because she feared what she'd do left alone with them in her apartment. Each day she walks by the river and wonders how many rocks she'd need to pack into her pockets before walking in. In the same breath, she tells me that she is the more stable of us in our relationship because she doesn't linger too long on her issues doesn't bleed onto others like you goes unsaid and then the phone call ends my throat swells but she calls me back in just an hour telling me she talked to anusha and everything was fine i bite my lip grind my teeth push breath through my nose i want to scream when i ask why you couldn't talk to me she says don't guilt me for doing what i need Um, so the next poem is called for all the things I've done parentheses. Can we still call it love close parentheses? I've kissed her in my mind a thousand times. I've kissed the hollow of her throat, followed the path between her breasts. She seen me at my most bare trembling, clinging. I've broken down on her doorstep in her arms. I've sobbed. I've memorized all her stories and wrote new ones with her as well. All the words we wrote, sweet and heartbreaking and full. We fell together the way one sinks into a couch during an anime marathon. We sat three feet apart, whispered thoughts. My eyes strained to memorize the glow of hers in the dark. I clung to her with a glee for hiding, desiring to be unseen by everyone but her. We spend days, weeks, measured in ends in her bed, yet we touched with an unease. I reached for her in my sleep. She still pulled away. I told her I loved her to get her to stay, even as she was far away from my arms. I lied when I said I loved her, but I didn't break her heart when I finally told the truth. She said, I never meant to hurt you when I begged her to beg me. I wanted her to apologize a thousand times. Two years later, still craving some lie of hers in return. All right. So this next one is called, it's during one of our autumn X-File marathons. It's during one of our autumn X-File marathons that she tells me that she got a tram stamp of Mulder's face. She stands up fast, flipping up her shirt to reveal what her low rise jeans can't hide. The art is pretty realistic and I laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh. This never happened. Instead, her first tattoo is of a butterfly. We sit in the library as I inspect it. She got it during spring break. It flies just above the waistband of her jeans, right on the small of her back. The lines are fading like a scab. Beginning to fall away, the ink a little patchy. She moves away for college that summer. I see her a year later, me in a tank top and jeans, her still wearing her long sleeves in July heat, passing a blunt back and forth behind the little hill at the park. I'd come to visit after she moved back home. We would talk a lot about our dreams, how they always seem so far beyond our reach. She'd scoff and say, you're not like me. Butterfly earrings swinging as she says this, like her tattoo, the paint is faded and chipped. I remember her endless phone calls on Halloween and not picking up because of class and homework. The next day, the Colorado Springs Police Department calls me, says her body was found by the hill next to the tree right off the main road. I know this place well. They tell me she was found with her wrist slit, fire ants crawling out of her wounds, the butterfly tattoo exposed. But this never happened. Instead, the hospital calls me that night, 
just as I'm trying to return her missed phone calls, tells me she had cut herself but called the cops just in time to be saved. When they tell me I have 10 minutes to her to speak to her, she apologizes but jokes that the hill is now hers. She's bled on it after all. All right. Mm -hmm. So that's like the end of the super triggering suicidal poems. Um, so this next one is one of my favorites. Um, it's called Open Letter to Beyonce after the release of 40, 444. And daddy made a soldier out of me. Daddy lessons. Revel in that apology. Bathe in it. Feed yourself with it. Use it in place of breast milk for your babies. And I hope it keeps you warm at night. I've known apologies like this. They always leave me wanting. I've seen men like Jay my entire life. Both of us been born and bred by these daddy lesson type men who raise us on contradictions, too smart for bullshit, gun ready for any of these trifling boys who try and try us and yet grasping and yearning for empty apologies two decades too late. Men like our fathers, men like your husband, who only understand love as a performance of status, the currency of power. He told you, don't embarrass me instead of be mine, bought you a big house with your money, told you to sit tight, hold still, be pretty, while he fucked Becky and all her good hair glory. And doesn't pretty hurt when you sit in the house you built with your love all alone? I too have lived my life for everyone else but me. Scorned the love of all my mothers for a drop of affection from a man who saw his daughter as a rib, an extension of his legacy, rather than the woman I was. I too live the fantasy, a projection not of my own making. You and I have prayed for change, to be loved for who we are, to be seen in full, to be caught as we fall. But let's have a moment of honesty. You and I ain't never been mature for our age. Ain't no way a man 11 years your senior didn't learn a trick or two about how to convince a woman to take responsibility for way more than her due. My father used to say that to me too. Now I'm priming my rifle to shoot. All right, so this, uh, the next two poems are gonna be new, are, are new poems. Um, I wrote them over the summer. Um, I hope y'all like them. They, they're, still, they're so new, they're not even titled. <clears throat> so this one was inspired by an old friend of mine who I'm not friends with anymore. It goes like this. In a town so white, it names, its name calls upon the memory of a massacre and the KKK. It makes a drought of blackness that the few of us drink each other up out of thirst and the need to survive. I met him in an English class where we were the only two black kids in the whole department. And I clung to him as if he was the only thing keeping me alive. And maybe he was. He was tall, dark, and beautiful, and he knew it. it was, he was overconfident with it, thought he could treat women any way because of it. But my eyes became blind to the way he clearly thought of me as a situationship rather than a genuine friend. Because in this drought, who else was there to keep me tethered to the ground? I wonder now if that's why we're no longer friends. That neither of us could carry the burden of feeding the desire for blackness and the proof that we still existed, not yet claimed by the whiteness banging at our door. All right. So this next one was inspired by um, Igbo Landing, which is a very important historical site for Black Americans. Um, I had the opportunity to go and visit the site, but I found out I couldn't actually see the site directly because I found out it now currently resides on private property. So this was inspired by that rage. Okay. <clears throat> I cannot even res pay respect to my ancestors without these bullshit capitalists in my way. Igbo Landing resided on private property, so my ancestors, even in their resting place, are trapped by capitalists who think land and water and people should be owned. Fuck that. I hope the spirits refuse them peace. No vice can drown out their blood-curdling battle cries 
or their grief. Yes, capitalists are vindictive, sadistic gremlins, so maybe being unable to drown cries won't terrify them as they lay comfortably in their feather beds. Wouldn't it be just another lullaby, a promise that brings a shiver of delight? How they fantasize about the many depravities one body can withstand without crumbling. So instead I lay a curse at their feet. May the spirits drive them from their house, abandon all possessions, and walk the earth endlessly, with no embrace, brutal or otherwise. No rest, unable to stop even as their feet bleed and their knees buckle beneath them, with no legacy or no cultural memory of them left. And... One last poem. I read this um, the first time I read for y'all. Um, it's gone up, but under a bit of um, revision since then. So here it goes. It's called A Hymn for the Ancestors. A note of a song caught in my throat, sitting softly on my tongue, lips pressed close. A hum becomes a hymn, my brown eyes wide and wowed with the warm flame of awe, a breath the light of the moon washing over me, a breath, chin tilted back, the brown skin of my neck exposed to the night sky. This is reverence. It is no words but demands a name. Say it soft. Standing is an embrace, intention, a creation of feeling. Decaying leaves space for healing. This conversation with God, and who is God but the bones of your ancestors, soil as red as blood beneath your feet. And it becomes a prayer, this soft hum. A honeybee sings, the tick, tick, ticking click of a death beetle. Him, a choir of rushing waves kissing the shore. This prayer never becomes louder than a satisfied sigh. The release of breath that reminds me that I'm alive. And thank you. That was it. That's all I got for y'all. <laughs> that was amazing, Zora. Thank you so, so much. I feel like we were like, we've seen every emotion in the carousel at the end of that like set. And I'm just like, I'm just trying to gather my, my bits and stuff while while I switch tabs, etc. Uh, wow, yeah, okay. So again, that was Zora Satchel who shared with us some old work, some new work, some great work, regardless of what time it's from, who you can find on Twitter at The Casual Revolt, T-H-E-C-A-S-U-A-L-R-E-V-O-L-T. -E um, and Zora was too humble to brag in the little form sheet that we send out to all our readers. But please, please, please check out Zora's poems uh, on Drunk Monkeys. She's the August feature, and their five poems that are there are just amazing. So please give them a read. And thank you again, Zora, for coming back to Performance Anxiety. Um, whew, yeah, okay. So I'm like scrolling and stuff. So I'm super excited to introduce our next reader, not only as a reader for performance anxiety, but also because she's taken the helm on a project that I, I care a lot about and she's doing an amazing, amazing justice to. Uh, and that is Melissa Ashley Hernandez. Melissa is a Latinx writer working on her MFA in creative writing and publishing from DeSales University. You can find her work in the Minisan zine and her forthcoming chapbook, The Love in Between, to be published by Lazy Adventure Publishing in January of 2021. So, Melissa, take it away, and thanks for all the hard work you're doing to get the Minisan oh, zine stop. going. stop. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, I love it. I love it, so I don't mind it. Um, I have, I have five um, I kind of run the gamut between family and love and, and stuff that I'm about to read today is uh, actually from my chat book that will be out in January, like Tom said. So, out with up. My father read me stories at night and I would make him use different voices for every character. In his thick Dominican accent, he would tell me about the little girl who destroyed his chair and ate all his avena, or about the magical harp he had stolen from a giant in the sky and how he needed my help to chop down the beanstalk. He would lament about not being able to attend the ball, and he would cry out for his fairy godmother as I would roar with laughter. At the end of each story, I would always beg for one more to extend my time with this man who made me feel like I was living 1,000 lives in one night. How I cherish those moments where I could be anything. 
Years went by. Work became more taxing. Sadness became more an agoraphobic roommate than a fleeting visitor. The fleeting visitor became conversation. Both older, I feel we live on polar opposite sides of the earth. Does he feel like one of his tale characters? Like Rapunzel in her impossible towel with no way out but down? Or the prince doomed to roam the unforgiving desert helpless, blind? Now, I spend every night alone, reading to myself in silly voices, wishing I could live 1,000 lives and how my father go to the ball, wishing I could line all the pumpkins up and touch each one with a magic wand. Okay. <laughs> um, my next one is called Scars. As a young child, I was afraid of cracked open closet doors and the boogeyman under my bed. Witches and zombies, vampires and the wolfman, the devil. I would scurry to my bed after turning off the lights to outrun the gnarled, twisted hands reaching out for me, cover my entire body with a comforter in 90 degree heat to avoid being taken in the night. My bed perpetually prepared with a plush battalion in combat at ready positions should the need for battle arise while I slept. Many nights in my youth were filled with this type of fear, a rational, silly, crippling. It wasn't until I grew up and fell in love that I realized monsters are very real, but they don't live in your closet. Okay, how about a happy one now? Let's do a happy one. <laughs> this one is called jo Riding my bike, book in basket, I coasted through the greenery until I came across the perfect patch to lay my blanket on the soft ground. Sprawling out in the sun, I watched the author's images build their world as the forest danced in my imagination. Like an old friend coming by, dusk appeared. Welcome, although unexpected. The fading light interrupted my literary choreography. I looked up from the pages to notice a different dance happening in the air in front of me. Dozens of glowing bugs gliding above the grass in fluid motions. Ease. How wonderful would it be if humans could communicate by lights? Whenever we cried, a soft blur would surround us. Happiness would be a bubble of light, anger, a violence, and laughter. Oh, la laughter would be an incandescent twinkling, human, peaceful, bright. Okay, uh, this one is, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, this one is, is six feet apart. This one is actually about uh, the quarantine. Uh, I wrote this one maybe two weeks, three weeks into it. So six feet apart. I trail behind you about six feet or so to distance myself, keep us both protected. They say six is safest but safe is too much space. We wear masks, walk slow, empty streets. In the road, there are no cars out tonight. We talk about normal things. How was work? You got so much done today. The weather was nice. Postponed plans for weddings, date nights push for months. Hospitals were run and post-apocalyptic grocery stores, an empty Times Square. Cemeteries so flooded with the dead that people are turned away by the wave of a gloved hand. How do we function with closed funeral homes? What will we do with our dead and how many dead will we have? How will we celebrate their life when doing so risks our own? We just keep walking through 
the eerie, quiet, six feet apart. And we leave. We don't kiss goodbye. And now I'm going to end it on a, on a sort of bittersweet, happier kind of poem. This one is called Saudade, uh, which is a word uh, that essentially means um, the longing for that nostalgic feeling of the past that you know you will never get back again. Um, If I could, I would bottle the sound of a Game Boy startup. The way safety scissors glide through construction paper, the shutter of a Polaroid camera, the ksh of a spinning yo-yo, and create a spray on my pillow to remind me of it, like an old love that left on good terms. I would savor the notes of my morning sandwich and dad. Add teal 95 Corolla as fresh air played on the radio. The memory of the roller rinks jazz cup wall performing their black light dance. The joyful jingle ice cream truck. Hourglass time never hung up. No longer dumping Legos on our carpets or hoping we can get the Crayola 64 count. The bike spoke still. Our crayons still lay forgotten. A light lidded tub container in the attic with the rest of our child. Thank you. That was all of them. Thank you so much, Melissa, for those beautiful poems, for sharing them with us. Um, again, that was Melissa Ashley Hernandez, who is on Twitter at M-A-C-H writing, all one word, and on Instagram at Melissa M-A-C-H writing, all one word. Um, and again, I'm super excited to introduce Melissa, not only as a reader, but also as the um, founding editor in chief for the Minisan project, which is a project for 14 letter or 14 character poems. Um, and they're going to be taking submissions, I think, soon. Uh, there's another issue in the works right now. Um, and you can visit the site at the Minisan project .com. Minisan is M-I-N-I-S-O-N -S for minimal sonnet. Uh, and you can follow them on Twitter at Minisan project and on Instagram at the Minisan project. Um, but all of that should not eclipse the fact that Melissa has a beautiful chapbook being published uh, in January by Lacey Adventurer Publishing with a lot of the poems in it. Um, the chapbook is called The Love in Between, and a lot of the poems you heard tonight are from that chap. So thank you so much again, Melissa, for being here. Thank you. And I'm really excited to follow the Mini Sound Project as it, as it <laughs> visits its different iterations. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. And I, I get always kind of bummed at this point because, believe it or not, we're already to our last reader, um, even though I think we did save an incredible, incredible poet for last. So I'm very excited to introduce Ashley Elizabeth, who is a writer, writing consultant and teacher, shout out, who lives and works in Baltimore with her partner and their cat. She has been featured in Drunk Monkeys and Kahini Quarterly. Her inaugural chapbook, You Were Supposed to Be a Friend, was recently released from Nightingale and Sparrow. Ashley, thank you for finding time in this crazy teaching schedule that we are all living in to, to read with us tonight. I appreciate it deeply. Oh, yeah, no problem. I was, like, thinking about it earlier. I'm like, oh, gosh, it's 9 o'clock. <laughs> um, but it's okay because tomorrow's a TV day. So, I mean, I got time. <laughs> Um, so I'll be reading a few poems. I'm going to do all my trigger warnings now. Um, like there's some mention about uh, grief and loss. Some mention about um, dark moments in American history, aka I'm black and I'm angry. Um, and <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's like most of my. That's like most everything. And then also one quarantine poem all the way at the end. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Um, so this first poem um, is called Kitchen Conversation. My grandmother ate cut cantaloupe from the tip of her knife. My father, one of her middle children, told her to stop, that eating with a ribbed spine wasn't safe. She shrugged, neither is being black, being a woman, I'll die someday, and popped another juicy cue into her waiting mouth, knife, ridges. 
like she's just been on my mind a lot recently so i have like another poem that's also dedicated to her um called a taste of memory and mashed so. pour in the milk until you think it's enough baby go ahead don't be scared pour with your left and stir with the right go slow make sure it's right throw a fork in and taste it what's it missing a test to memory. What's it missing, little one? Salt, just a little, more than a little pepper. Taste again. What's it missing? I stir one more good stir for a nine-year-old and grab another fork. Taste again. Kiss my grandmother on the cheek on the way to the pantry for just a little extra. I look at her as I sprinkle. A slight smile and indicated that's enough. No need to taste again until on plate. Um, yeah, it's been, gosh, like seven years. And like, I have not made mashed potatoes in like this entire time. Because, <laughs> because like, I don't want to mess them up. <laughs> um, so that's the thing. I mean, like, probably eventually I'll make them, but, um, it's okay because I just order it and, you know, most times it's fine. Um, but so the next few poems um, I'll be talking about are, like, are all, well, like, everything I've read have, has been, like, pretty recent in that I've written it in the past year or so, well, past few months, really. Um, and this next poem's no exception. Um, let me just turn to it. I have like some poems in, in a notebook and some like on a screen. So, so many things. But this summer I was doing a lot of ancestry work. Um, really trying to dig into my past and see like where I come from, who I come from, things like that. Um, so when I was doing some research, I found that being an idiot was considered like a condition so and like that like really for some reason like sh like struck a chord with me I don't know if it's just because I'm a teacher I don't know if it's like it could just be like a combination of things like that's so appalling um so this poem is kind of about that condition idiotic adjective definition one cannot read or write Definition two, extreme intellectual disability on the same level as blind, deaf, and mute. So this means all of my greats were idiotic until almost 1900. Descendants of slaves, detained bodies, scratched in the sand with stick, can't read signs for shit, can't sign for shit, this is what we mean when we say white people had a head start. Um, ancestors fell under anti-literacy law. Free or not, all were Southern, all were stupid. So like doing this ancestry work, like it just really touched me and like, I'm still not done. I've only found, you know, there's only so much that I can find. Um, so over the, ne like, next summer when I have more time, I'll be doing more, <laughs> more ancestry work, um, because, you know, teaching in this coronavirus time is not, um, not the easiest, um, so, yeah, we're gonna go into another poem that I wasn't gonna read at first but it kind of just it's like it kind of goes with that it's also a relatively new poem um and in that in that ancestry work i was doing i was um i found africa um like straight from like my grandfather's like mother's side um so I'm writing like a series of poems toward this woman. Um, she did not have a name. She just had Boogie Tribe and then the name of her master. So I'm writing 
a bunch of poems dedicated to her. Um, and hopefully, fingers crossed, um, I can turn it into a book. Um, discover the new world here. Clothes you do not have to pick the fabric for. Cell phones where we see neighborly trauma and don't bat an eye. Shitty schools, inequality nonstop. I am this house's master now, but own nothing. No one else outside of the cat, and I recognize I don't even own her. Um, I am blessed enough to not work with my hands like you hope, or, or are forced to fuck a white man to keep my family safe. Um, yeah, so like hope is the name that I've given her. Um, and then one more historical poem. Skipping some things. It is historical in the way that black bodies have been trash receptacle for spewing white filth, yet are expected to educate white folk on the way white folk treat the bodies of others. Gotta remind them that while water fountains were delineated as white, black titties nursed all babies, black hands changed all diapers, black hands did the cooking, fed y'all, but now y'all want to spit us out as if we deserved it, as if we chose to be us in the first place. I'm going to do like one more kind of like sad poem. Well, unfortunately, like most of them are sad, but um, one more like, like super emotional poem for me. Like this is the first time I've like read this poem out loud. Um, like I just finished writing it a couple weeks ago and it's something else. Um, so it's called Burnt Sienna. My mother texts my brother and I, quote, today is the four year anniversary of my mother's passing, end quote. My throat knows this already. How could it not? Woke up one and a fifth of vodka, despite being mostly sober for three years, went to bed with migraine, unmoving, unable to move, unable to start my day seeing her burnt sienna face, with those bug eye, bug eye glasses from the 80s on Facebook. I need no more reminders that I have nothing left, that I have no reason to return to Boston now, that I regret not returning to Boston that summer. I lost the job, stumbling over simple slurred words unprepared for some of the classes of children in my care, lost myself to the liquid golden ticket poorly hidden in TV cabinets, lost my grandmother to internal parasite and broken dendrite, chomping away at bits I never reached, lost my mother to this life, this weekly pillbox taken over the past 26 years to literal broken heart. Why she celebrates things that should only be remembered, the scattergun of caretaker ways and suppressed squeal of lost years is beyond me. I'm gonna switch into a book, I mean, a poem from my chapbook, if you were supposed to be a friend. Um, just gonna do one from here and then my quarantine poem and then I'm out. Um, so this poem, well, this, this book is about uh, obviously friendship turned into more than a friendship turned wrong um so this one is lies about being a mistress one it's fun two you're going to leave her for me because i am that much better three you love me four i can't do any better five i can stop at any time. Six, you'll leave her. Really? Seven, I'm not the side chick. I'm the current investment in the future you don't know you want yet. Eight, do not blame me. 
and then nine. I'm fine, just the inner side. So if you like that poem, definitely buy my chat book. Um, it, it's available from Nightingale and Sparrow. Um, there's Kindle version, uh, ebook version, and a paperback version. Um, so yeah, if you like that poem, you're gonna love the other ones. Um, and then I'm gonna just go into my quarantine poem, which is like my last poem for the night. Um, and a lot of this, so like this poem I wrote like towards the beginning, like in April or so, and you know, we all thought things were gonna get back to normal sometime soon. And we are in, what is it, October, and we're still in the, in the house. Um, but I wrote this when we were planning the eighth graders graduation because I didn't get to hug them. So that, that kind of hurt my heart. Um, so this is called what the aftermath will look like. When this is over and people feel comfortable traveling, blessing sneezes instead of stares, I will break sobriety to bar hop with my sisters and treat them to shop Join in the fun, giggle, dare one of them to ask out the bartender because they will look so good together and tip more than 20%. When this is over and businesses open all at once, I will take my time tiptoe downtown, visit every bookstore, museum, and restaurant I haven't aged out of as more than just stretching my legs and be sugarcane sweet to the staff as thank you. And I will buy something with the pennies that somehow stretch through months. And I will worry about my wallet later. When this is over, some of my children won't be my children anymore, but will move on to high school without more than virtual love, without promotion ceremony, without one last hug from the school year. When this is over, people will act like this never happened, but I will remember put palms together and pray for peace. Thank you guys. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate this space. Thank you. Thank you so much again for finding the time and one of the craziest times I speak from the first person to teach ever. So it's like, this is so weird, but we're so glad that you were able to join us and share this wonderful poems from that wonderful chap. Again, that was Ashley Elizabeth, who you can find on Twitter and Instagram at AE the Poet. Um, and that chapbook, one more time, was called You Were Supposed to Be a Friend. It's available right now from Nightingale and Sparrow, all one word, dot com. Um, and also, you can keep Keep up with Ashley's other publications at writingashleyelizabeth.wordpress.com. Oh, awesome. Oh, there's so much, so much cutting edge, new stuff, beautiful work that we got to hear tonight. Um, yeah, I just, I'm always just so galvanized by this stuff. And, you know, at this point of the evening, as we wind down, I just want to say thank you so much to all of our readers for sharing their incredible work with us tonight. And thank you, too, to our listeners for giving this hour plus of your lives over to poetry. And I hope if you're listening, you might consider dropping us a line at Performance Anxiety, Performance ANXT on Twitter or at my email, which is tomsnarski at gmail.com. Um, if you'd ever like to share your work at a future event, tell your friends, people who don't usually read, make them read because we, we see so much amazing stuff that way. And it's we love to have stuff like this to look forward to in times like these. Um, our next reading is going to be November 19th at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. There's definitely slots still open. And as a closing gesture, I know, uh, you know, finding little things to celebrate has been really great. Um, so when Louise Glick won the Nobel uh, last week, I got really excited. So I'm going to read a quick poem to close by Louise called Descent to the Valley from her book Vita Nova. Descent to the Valley. I found the years of the climb upward difficult, filled with anxiety. I didn't doubt my capacities. Rather, as I moved toward it, I feared the future, the shape of which I perceived. I saw the shape of a human life, on the one side always upward and forward into the light, on the other side downward into the mists of uncertainty, all eagerness undermined by knowledge. I have found it otherwise. The light of the pinnacle, the light that was theoretically the goal of the climb, proves to have been poignantly abstract, 
My mind, in its ascent, was entirely given over to detail, never perception of form, my eyes nervously attending to footing. How sweet my life now, in its descent to the valley. The valley itself, not mist-covered, but fertile and tranquil, so that for the first time, I find myself able to look ahead, able to look at the world, even to move toward it.